Hello, everyone. Today, I am joined by Misty Winkler, who is a fellow second-generation homeschool mom of five. She is married to her high school sweetheart, and she teaches moms to organize their attitudes and their lives at simplyconvivial.com. She is also a podcast co-host on several of my favorite podcasts, including School A Sisters and a previous podcast guest here at Homeschool Conversations. And so I'm just delighted to have you back again today, Misty. Could you just tell us a little bit about your family and who you are for anyone who doesn't already know you? Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, so my husband and I both were homeschooled from the beginning uh, through I was homeschooled through high school. Uh, his mom put him in high school for that math teacher. <laughs> but we were homeschooled pretty much all the way through and um, got married at 19. So we just celebrated 20 years of marriage and our oldest just turned 18. So we're kind of in uh, transition, it feels like, from one phase of life. We're kind of staring down change <laughs> and sending sending kids off instead of adding kids in so uh, my oldest is 18 then I have a 16 year old son and a 13 year old daughter an 11 year old son and an eight year old daughter so I just it's so much fun to talk to someone else in that <laughs> same kind of season because what we did is definitely out of the norm but fellow 19 year old bride, uh, my oldest was born 10 <laughs> months later. So, but definitely like facing that same kind of weird transition time where my baby is now six, my oldest is 16 and doing dual enrollment. And like, we're really facing this sort of different season of life. And it's kind of like, I'm having an identity <laughs> crisis. Like I was the young <laughs> mom with little kids for so long. <laughs> like that's not who I am anymore. It's very weird. <laughs> It is funny then to, you know, be at church or whatever. And it's like, oh no, they are the young moms. They're younger than me. Right. <laughs> but my husband and I still like to be like, we still claim that we're the, the, the happy couple. That's what people called us when we first got married. <laughs> oh, you're the happy couple. We were so happy. <laughs> so we're still the happy couple. <laughs> nice. I like that. <laughs> well, in the midst of, while well, we are the happy couple, um, you know, homeschooling <laughs> can definitely be a challenge. It is a wonderful, good mm -hmm. gift. And I often just repeat this, it's the best hard thing I do. And it is a hard thing. And so homeschool moms, including myself, we can often have days or seasons where we are weary and tired and discouraged. And what we are called to do just seems like too much for us, right? And a lot of the encouragement we hear seems to fall short of actually transforming and being actually helpful encouragement. So I wanted to kind of talk to you about what is true encouragement and why is that important? Why do we need it? And why do we get sucked up in these lies of things that maybe are called encouragement, but maybe aren't actually helpful? Yeah, it, I mean, homeschooling and in a culture that wants things to be fast and easy, it's extra hard because our expectations are that things ought to be fast and easy. Or, you know, I should be able to figure things out. And then basically it boils down to they'll go my way. <laughs> And things going our own way isn't actually God's plan. They're, that's not usually God's way. He works in our lives through difficulty, through suffering, through hard work. He calls us to put forth effort. And so looking at, you know, solutions or encouragement or help that will make things um, be easier isn't always the right way. You know, it depends on what kind of easier we're looking for. <laughs> but if easier means everyone does what I say every single time, we're always going to be discouraged because that's never going to happen. You know, our expectations for how life in general goes need to be in 
in line with reality, in line with what God's revealed in his word. And anything that is not gospel is always going to fall short. So, you know, the perfect planner, the um, any kind of encouragement that boils down to you are enough, you are good enough, that's anti-gospel because we aren't. And so they're always going to end up leaving us in a worse spot. Do you think that in the current kind of culture of, of homeschool encouragement that you're seeing a lot? I mean, I see a lot of people really speaking to that first part of what you were saying, that this expectation of perfection is unachievable. You know, our children are not going to be perfect products. Um, we are not going to be perfect mm -hmm. homeschool parents. I think more and more people are are coming to sort of see that. So where do you see sort of some of the, the dangerous, unhelpful attitudes of encouragement? Or what would be some examples, I guess, of not like a, a person, but like uh, ideas, topics that would be sort of like, this is put forth as encouragement and maybe it's actually not truly helpful. Yeah. Yeah, it, you probably saw this too, but growing up being homeschooled, homeschooling in the 80s and 90s was focused, it seemed a lot more than it is now on um, do this and get this result. If you just do things this way, then, you know, you'll have a happy, wonderful family. And um, in in kind of a pendulum swing, it seems now that um, the encouragement is more like it doesn't matter. Like you, you might not. Um, it's not worth pouring yourself out over this because you, you need to, you need to worry about yourself you need to take care of yourself. And so you shouldn't be working hard. Um, you shouldn't expect, um, it's not your job to make things turn out. So there's always um, a degree of truth in, in either end of the spectrum. And so it's just trying to find that balance of what is true and, um, and not go to either side of the ditch where we think that our effort is all that matters. And so we um, work really hard to get things right. And then the other side is there really isn't a right. You can't, ex like you just need to feel good. You need to help your kids feel good. And, um, you know, take it easy. <laughs> and, and it's hard because we do, you know, rest is important, but then if, if your rest isn't based in Christ and, um, defined by scripture, then rest is not refreshing. And it, it basically is being either apathetic or, um, just superficial. And then it doesn't end up being refreshing. I think that what you just said is so important because, you know, rest is such a constant refrain in scripture from the very mm -hmm. beginning of creation, right? It's part of the creation ordinance. It's built into creation that we have this rest. And then we see all the way up through this fulfillment. It's the sort of that already and the not yet, right? Like already Christ yeah. has come and he brings rest to his people. And he speaks of that. And in his accomplished work, like we can rest in Christ's work. But then in Hebrews, it says there is yet a rest to come for the people of God, right? And so we know that there's a sense in which we have rest now, and there's a sense in which there's a rest to come. And if we try to find rest and comfort and peace and anything other than in the gospel of Christ, like it's ultimately going to fall short. Um, and I think I, I definitely see that a lot. I mean, in, in all of our lives, it's that idolatry, right? Like we, we always are yeah. looking to other things. And I think it can be so hard because all of these things have bits of truth in them. Like, okay, mm -hmm. well, actually 
I actually do need to like prioritize taking showers and making sure I'm getting good sleep and going for walks. And you know what? Sometimes going and getting a pedicure actually is, you know, self-care, quote unquote. Like I know that term like is so loaded because people either love it or hate it, but there are things where we're not Gnostics. We see the value of taking care of even our own physical bodies. It's not all like, um, when we, we speak of laying our lives down, but that doesn't mean that we like don't care about our own physical health or well-being either. Right. And so it's like, we're yeah. always in these tensions and these pulls of all these different aspects that we're trying to, to keep in mind. And I think it's way too easy, especially on the internet, like, because people like to click mm -hmm. on links. Um, you know, it's way too easy for someone to be like, this isn't self-care or, <laughs> this is how you care for yourself. And it's just sort of like this very black and white um, dichotomy where I think the mm -hmm. truth is a lot more nuanced than that. I don't know. Do you agree? <laughs> Disagree? Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of someone who has some self-care blog posts out there. <laughs> yes. I think that the real difficulty there is that the, the secular world today is entirely materialist. They don't believe that the spiritual plane exists. And so something like a pedicure, the physical outward things that we do are all that there is. And so you have to do them to take care of yourself. And they're the only option that you As Christians, we recognize the spiritual um, side of reality and ourselves and if we don't have spiritual rest first, then those other things aren't really going to matter. Without Christ, without having spiritual rest, those other things are never going to satisfy. But if you're based in your rest and security and confidence being in uh, your salvation, in trust that God is working out his will in the world, even if it's different than what yours is. If you don't have that firm foundation, or I should say when you do have that firm foundation, then the pedicure is a lovely blessing that you could totally enjoy as um, a gift. And it's not something that you need to survive. It can be just a blessing that you enjoy. Um, I know there was one time I had only little kids and, um, I don't know. I, I remember being at the sink and just feeling like I have to get away. Like, I just can't take it anymore. The noise level, the, the fact that I feel like I'm busy all the time and never getting anywhere. I've just got to leave. I've got, <laughs> and you did, my husband came back from work or something. He let me leave and it was. And I did, I went and I got, and it was nice to be gone, but the attitude that I left the house with um, didn't go away by getting a pedicure <laughs> or a manicure. And I came, and so it felt nice and it felt like a break, but I came back and as soon as I came through the doors, I felt just, I felt it was like that slam of overwhelm and discouragement immediately again and um it it's because the I didn't do anything to deal with my attitude with my heart about my job and responsibilities um if I if I had gone away no matter what I got away to do if there had been repentance then I could have enjoyed that manicure if <laughs> my heart had been right. But without the heart being right, none of the other stuff really matters. We have to deal with our attitude, our heart, our perspective first before any of those other things are in order. Yeah. And how often even a spiritual thing, the same kind of thing, like if you don't deal and repent with the heart attitude first, even if you had gone and like read your Bible and done a Bible study for an hour, I don't know, maybe I'm the only mom who has this happen, but like you have a, a devotional time or you go to a ladies Bible study at church and then you come home and you're like, why did no one clean the kitchen while I was gone? You know, so even a quote unquote spiritual thing there, you know, oh yeah, that's real like soul care there. And if it's still mm -hmm. done in the flesh, 
it's, it's every bit as unrestful. I think that's where the incarnation, like, again, like resting in the work of Christ makes such a difference because he is fully God and fully man. And so both the, the spiritual and the physical, they're linked together perfectly for he was able to perfectly do both as, you know, or do both aspects is like, that's probably heresy. I shouldn't say it that way, but you know, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm like, wait, as soon as you start talking about the, the person and work of Christ, you're like one step away from heresy all the time. <laughs> okay. I got to make sure I'm not like going against any of the church councils here, but what I'm trying to say is he teaches us as we see him, you know, he teaches us that the soul and the body are both in Christ in the process of being redeemed right in him and are covered mm -hmm. by his work and his redemption. So, yeah. 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 And we do need both. We, we need that bodily rest too, because we are creatures, we are humans. And that's a part of our being that God does provide for. And so sometimes in refusing to rest physically, it can be a way of refusing the care that um, God offers us. So we have the care and the, the spiritual care of the gospel and repentance and forgiveness, and then also a good night's sleep. And these other, these are all good gifts that God, you know, gives us out of grace. Yeah. Well, you know, there's sort of the flip side when on one hand, we want this like rest and peace and this like wonderful, you know, encouragement. And then <laughs> at the same time, I, you know, and maybe this isn't true for everyone. I know in my own sinful heart, there is this drive to like do something awesome. Like I want to do something awesome for yeah. God and like be the best homeschool parent. It's not enough to just like do a good job. I have to do the best job and do something great and amazing in this family. And um, I like have to repent of that, honestly, a lot. That's really bad. Um, and a lot of times what God is calling us to do is actually very simple, very ordinary, not flashy. Um, mm -hmm. just very much not gr a great thing. And so how ought we to reorient our perspective as homeschool moms? And then how can that sort of change of attitude and perspective really bring joy and encouragement in those sort of very ordinary days? Yeah. Well, I think God does great things with our ordinary work and God is a lot more patient than we are. We see that throughout scripture and just, you know, history. Uh, God's very patient, much more so than we are. And so his time frame is on a different scale than ours, than the one that we measure our work by. And so we get disproportionately discouraged, I think, over bad days and then lose sight over the long haul uh, but, you know, now with, a, with an 18-year-old doing college work all on his own, like I didn't do any of, in, any of the enrollment thing or, any, you know, he's independent and it's a little scary. It's different. And, um, but it, it gives you those moments where you step back and you're like, whoa, that happened. <laughs> and I never like saw it happening really it didn't feel like um you could catch little glimpses of it but um you get to that point but then you step back and you see it and realize it's not something I did I didn't like he is his own person and now it's just obvious that it's my duty now to step back and um you you see that God was at work this whole time doing something more than you ever really pictured. Or maybe you just didn't have that. It, it's different when it's real <laughs> than when it's like, and someday my children will show initiative and be productive in the world. And then you're like, well, so that happened. <laughs> Not exactly what I pictured it being, but that is what happened. And, um, What I think all of it, whether we're homeschooling or just parenting in general, whatever kind of roles and responsibilities, whatever callings God gives us, 
he is using for his purposes. And so that is great. So we don't need to figure out ourselves what our success does or doesn't mean or does or doesn't look like. Um, instead, we just need to do whatever is the good work that God has put in front of our lives and trust that he will do what he wants with it. Anytime we try saying, okay, so this is what I'm going to do. And then it's going to turn out like this. And I might say it's for God's glory or, or, you know, intend it to be that way. But when it's my agenda or my imagination or my definition of success, that's all stemming from pride and pride goes before the fall. <laughs> so, um, and I've just found that true over and over um, in my own life for sure. And you definitely see it in scripture and history. Um, it can, pride can look good for a time, but it will fall, it will collapse. And that's actually God, a part of God's good work is to keep us humble and to make sure that we recognize that anything good that comes is not from us. It's all from God. It's all grace. And he is working sanctification in us. That's his good purpose. That's his will for us. And so that might, you know, he uses everything in our lives for that purpose. And he uses us in our children's life for them. So it's their sanctification as well that we are helping work on, but it's God's work ultimately. And um, so that's a little bit more vague, if you will, than you know, getting a good job and showing initiative and all that. But whatever um, kind of personalities or callings or whatever combination each family gets, God's working sanctification in each individual, and that's his good purpose. And so knowing that, then we know that it's our job to repent <laughs> in order to move forward. And so when we're walking in repentance and humility, then um, we are led to rejoicing because we are experiencing forgiveness and then we can give that forgiveness and be in fellowship with God and with our family. And um, it's a different um, like compass point to, to aim at than jobs or college or um, any particular kind of outcome. Yeah, that repentance and then rejoicing in our forgiveness it's very similar to, you know, wondering at the work that God has done. And then that leads to worship, mm -hmm. which, you know, again, is kind of like humility and doxology, <laughs> but yep. that's, that's yep. what all of life ultimately comes down to. And I think that puts, just changes our perspective on what we're doing so much instead of us mm -hmm. being the center of the world, building something yeah. like the tower of Babel, right? Like <laughs> reaching up to God that's sort of the quintessential thing that we can often do as homeschool moms. Like we're building this amazing mm -hmm. tower and trying to reach God on our own. And that's in contrast to Jerusalem, God's holy city that, you know, is, is redeemed. It's the bride bought by him and built up. And then, then the amazing part, like I'm literally getting goosebumps thinking about it. Like <laughs> the amazing part is we, we are those living stones that God is using to build up his own city, right? So in contrast mm -hmm. to Babylon, to Babel, like we are being built into a city, not because we're doing it ourselves, but because Christ has redeemed us and it's going to be way more glorious and all for Christ. Right. So it's yeah. really yeah. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, and it's realizing that, that leads us to worship and worship is rejoicing and rejoicing is worship. And sometimes we are looking for that. We want to feel better. And the world tells us that all kinds of material things will help us feel better, but it is fulfilling our ultimate purpose that 
gives us joy and peace. And we don't just want superficial feel good. What we really want is what we were created for, which is peace and joy. And we get that by um, walking as God's people. And God promises his peace and his joy in, you know, regardless of circumstances. And the world tells us that our circumstances determine how we feel. And it instead, the, the physical things um, can be good gifts from God that are enjoyed in him. You know, the chocolate, the pedicures, these different things are great, but in and of themselves, they offer no peace or joy. Uh, and so we can't look to them for more than they are able to offer. They're not going to be able to, to ultimately save. <laughs> so let's bring these, I, we've been talking about these sort of big ideas and let's bring this down to like the day of homeschooling, like this day, this day when the yeah. mom is listening to this. Okay. Cause she's like, this is all great and everything. But like right now I'm just really struggling. <laughs> okay, this is like the daily grind we all face. Um, and it's really hard sometimes to find that joy. We, we want to have joy in the Lord and we're thinking, I'm thankful for the salvation and this eternal hope. This is great. And right now, like people are crying about fractions or whatever. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so how, how do we nurture a happy home and joy like in the midst of like this day right now? Yeah, I think no matter what's happening in the day, we can bring it back to repentance and we can know that the point is sanctification, not having a beautiful day. I think sometimes we put on a pedestal kind of the ultimate homeschool day we think that we have to achieve a certain calm and equilibrium for it to be a good day but any day that uh, I am convicted of sin and repent or that I have to convict a child of his sin and he repents that's a good day so, you know, that was just another step in sanctification, which is the point. So having those problems and hiccups and conflicts and all the things are all means that God is using to build us up and make, you know, chisel those stones into the city. And so it's not happening when everything is all smooth and easy, because when we uh, think that it's only a good day if everything is smooth, then that often leads us to avoid sin and conflict and those issues, the heart issues that are messy to deal with, but that's actually our calling is to um, discipline and disciple and that means dealing with the messy. It's not ignoring the mess or avoiding the mess or throwing a rug over the mess and trying to pretend it's not there. Uh, it's really in picking it up. And, um, you know, we have just, we've just, we're in our fourth week of school. So we have already dealt with math tears, with comparisons, with checklists being lost, with... <laughs> it's not just my kids. <laughs> some deceit. I mean, I have an 11-year-old boy, so we've, we've done all the things. <laughs> it's that season where a lot of discipleship and um, accountability is required, and a lot of... Um, parenting energy but that is the good work that we are being called to and we're actually being successful good homeschoolers when we are working through the hard struggles with our kids it's it's worth it it's hard work and it is exhausting but it's worthwhile 
it, it doesn't mean that you're a bad homeschooler. Like if I, we think if I was a good homeschooler, then independently, there would never be math tears. I would start the day on time. I wouldn't need three cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't end the day exhausted and ready for a nap, but that's just not true. A good homeschool day is the day that you walk your kids and yourself through the cycle of conviction and repentance and forgiveness, and then rejoicing and moving forward in, in doing the good work before us. That is such an encouragement and such a mindset shift. I think, you know, as homeschoolers, we like to talk about not having measurable goals in the same way, like our education, we measure it differently than the public schools or whatever, but how often do we actually create a different measurable set of goals for ourselves and we don't hit those. And so we can't like measure what happened in the day when, if we are repenting and discipling and repenting again, <laughs> I have to repent a lot. <laughs> Stopping to pray with our children. My husband is really good at this. Like, I'm like, all right, guys, let's get past this. Like, yes, that was wrong. Let's do, let's move on. And John's like, no, we're going to stop everything right now. Everybody's just going to stop and pray. And I'm like, we've got stuff to do. You know, like, you know <laughs> the most important thing that this we is... can do right now is prayer. And um, yeah, that, I'm, that is so often true. And again, that takes the time. You can't check off the boxes. Sometimes you don't get to check off boxes because you've spent the time really dealing mm -hmm. with with something else. Um, but what a gift that we, we have to do that. That we can, we can yeah. take that time and prioritize that in our day. And that's a, it's important. It really is. Yeah. I think the more years of homeschooling, you know, I was not a math person myself and my relationship with math has definitely grown and improved over the years of homeschooling. Uh, one thing that I never expected to strike me, but now it does just again and again, is that really life is like math. <laughs> and so all of these it. things, <laughs> it's like, this is just a metaphor for life right here. Because <laughs> the child's crying because they don't understand. And so because they don't understand, they say it doesn't make sense. And you're like, it does make sense. You're just having an issue right now and if you would you know take a drink of water and take a deep breath and and not assume that this is all terrible you know you might be able to see what's that this does make sense or you know they and so they're sad and crying because it's actually a challenging I mean we do that <laughs> we do that and uh, you know, sometimes it's math starts off easy, especially at the beginning of the year, the beginning of a book. And so you think, okay, I've got this. And as soon as you think, okay, I've got this, you know, new concept, time for a new something. Then you're like, no. And then, you, and then the kids throw up there, I'm bad at math. It's like, no, you just encountered a new concept. And we're going to work through it and learn. And, um, it's homeschooling is um, ripe with the metaphors and as is parenting. So I think the more I just watch my kids and dis disciple them and parent them, the more I see myself as being just like that. Yeah. Um, I, our friend Lena often says that homeschooling is just parenting intensified. And I think about that quote yes. all the time. And that's so true. And how it often is. what is really revealed more than my children's, you know, finiteness, weakness, and is my own. And I'm so thankful that God loves me enough to show me how sinful I am. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's where I think we ought to actually be encouraged when we're convicted. Because that is the Holy Spirit working in us. So it's a good thing. And it's uh, a part of God working in our lives. So it would be um, a, a terrible thing <laughs> if we weren't feeling conviction of our own sin. So if you're feeling convicted, that's actually good because you know that the you know what the right next thing to do is after you're convicted. It isn't 
just feeling guilt for and feeling bad. The point of conviction is to drive you to repentance and turning to God and receiving forgiveness for it. And then you're, then you experience that uh, freedom from the guilt after you've repented. Well, this has been a very encouraging conversation for me, but for the mom who can't just, you know, start a podcast so they have an excuse to talk to you. <laughs> you have a book coming out at the beginning of November, all about encouragement, true encouragement for homeschool moms. So can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yes, it is called The Convivial Homeschool. Um gospel encouragement for living and learning alongside your kids. And it is a set of 30 readings. So there are 30 chapters that each kind of stand alone. They each have a story from um, not just my homeschool, but also some from being homeschooled. And um, each one then points homeschool moms to the beauty of um, repenting and rejoicing on repeat just over and over again in different angles. Um, the book kind of follows an outline of guilt, grace, gratitude, which is uh, one way to summarize the gospel and the message of scripture. And you start with the bad news that we are sinful, we do mess up, and then we get grace. God freely gives it to us through no merit of our own. And then because of that, we live um, lives of gratitude in obedience. So, you know, it's in a way you could think of it kind of like a devotional. It's not a substitute for, <laughs> it's not a devotional, like where it's exegeting scripture or uh, any of Read that. Read your but Bible, is, moms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Read your Bible. <laughs> study scripture, but this is meant to be little five minute short encouragement readings for mom to just pick up, read one and be ready to head back into the fray, knowing that it's worth it. It sounds like it would be a really fun thing to do with a friend, like, you know, have a boxer friend that you could both read the same little short reading every day and then check in with each other at lunchtime and encourage one another in that. Yes, I, I will have a reading guide that goes with it where you can read it um, with a friend and study questions or, you know, thought provoking questions, um, reading it 30 days or um, a school year, like one chapter a week because it's 30 weeks and, you know, give or take, it's good to plan for 30 weeks, even if 36 are on your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, as an extrovert, you know, I think everything is more fun when you do it with somebody else. So <laughs> <laughs> I am very excited and looking forward to reading this. And I, I know that today's conversation will be an encouragement to many moms. So thank you for coming and chatting with us. So here, here at the end, I'm going to ask you the questions I've been asking everyone this season. And the first one is just, what have you been reading lately? I just finished Brothers Karamazov. I started it a year ago, and so I finally finished it. <laughs> there were a few times where I put it on the shelf for a while. <laughs> Didn't pick it like I, those Russian novels take, are a commitment. <laughs> They're a depressing commitment. <laughs> but I finished it, and now I am ready to go and read the introduction because I think there's stuff going on there that I'm. There's more there than meets the eye. So I need to figure it out. I, the Russians, I don't understand. I'm trying to understand and I don't. <laughs> I feel like with the Russian novels, it's like you read it the first time and then it's like, you're like, okay, I, I need to read that again. Now that I kind of know what's happening, but you're like, that took so long. I'm a little worried to, <laughs> no. to commit. Well, this was my second time through Brothers Karamazov. I actually listened to it on audiobook like six or seven years ago. And I got to the end and, and thought, I missed something like that was the end. I didn't, I don't get it. And so I was like, so I'm going to just read it, the paperback, because I spaced something here. There was some missing piece because the story didn't make sense. 
at the end. I got to the end and I'm like, nope, I didn't miss anything. (laughs) (laughs) So I I need to go read the introduction to the book now and figure out what just happened. (laughs) See, this is why my like two, actually two of my favorite books are Russian novels, but they're really more like novellas, I guess. So uh, one of the, like the very first thing that I ever like grabbed my imagination was Mm -hmm. One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich in high school. I read that and I just loved it. I've read it several times. I think it's fantastic. And it's also great because it's really short. (laughs) And then January 1st, 2020 for book club, we read um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy. Oh, I read that one. Oh, oh, Misty, you have to get this one. It's, it's also like so short. I'm telling you, like, then you can say <laughs> you've, you've read another Tolstoy novel, but it's like a lot shorter than Anna Karenina, which we read this summer. <laughs> but um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, like, you know, New Year's Day 2020, I was like, y'all, I'm calling right now. This is my favorite book of 2020. And everyone was like, Amy, 2020 is a whole year. Like, there's so much wonderful that is yet before you in this year. No, the end of 2020, I was like, yeah, no, actually that was the best thing to start 2020 with. (laughs) Highly recommend it. Sorry. I didn't mean to get on a tangent about Russian books, (laughs) but it's short and it's beautiful. I will add it. Yeah. Because I have a novel section for my, my school, a sister's five by five challenge where you read five books in five different categories and novels is one of my categories. So now that it's taken me this long to get through brothers Karamazov, I need a short one. Well, this one would be perfect. I read it in one day. You could totally do it. (laughs) Well, uh, moving on from Russian literature, (laughs) the other question that I'm asking everyone this season is just, what is your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly? Well, the tip that I have needed to remember myself the most these last few weeks has been to... um, look at the children's checklists every day and check, look at their work. (laughs) Trust, but verify. (laughs) And knowing that you will verify helps with that, that trust bit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And if you're like, you know, I have, I have, I'm homeschooling five, you know, I guess you're not homeschooling five currently, but you were at one point, you know, and um, I know that the reality is I can't necessarily verify every single thing for every single subject for every single child, every single day or week. So what I do is I just make sure I'm verifying some random things for each child every week. So it sort of rotates through. So they never quite know what I'm going to check. That's that's a good trick too. Yes. <laughs> Something where they know that they will be accountable for it. That's right. <laughs> or even at this point, it's just, okay, have, I need to see your checklist so that I know that you didn't lose it. Because uh-huh. <laughs> it turns out that losing it does not mean that you don't have to do it. This year, I'm trying something different. I There's laminated those. <laughs> This year I laminated their weekly checklist because I do kind of a week at a glance and um, I've been writing mm-hmm. just a few things with wipe off marker, but then they can wipe it off at the wipe off marker. And I was like, don't lose this. I had to pay for this. <laughs> I, can't <lose> this. <laughs> I can't reprint this. <laughs> so unless you want to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Misty, thank you so much for chatting today. Where can people find you all around the internet? I blog at simplyconvivial.com and I also have a podcast called Simply Convivial. I'm on the Scully Sisters podcast and I also have a subscription site, a membership site that is called Simply Convivial Continuing Education where um, as a community we work together to Uh, make progress in our homemaking habits, in our personal discipline, in our attitudes, and just organize life and manage life better while keeping sanctification and our attitudes and our hearts the, the always the place where we start. I will have links to all of those things in the show notes for this episode over at humilityandoxology.com. I'll chat with you later, Misty. Thanks, Amy.